Okay. Well, a pleasant good evening to, to us all, all distinguished ambassadors and those who are listening in um, by YouTube, um, those who are listening in on Facebook, and those who are listening in on our LinkedIn and other profiles. Pleasant good evening to you. I'm His Excellency Dr. Michael Steele, and I want to acknowledge the presence of our COO for the class of Steele, Her Excellency Doreen Barunji. She is based in Uganda. I also want to acknowledge our Chief of Protocol in the United Kingdom, His Excellency Dr. Donald Ewers. He is in the United Kingdom. I want to acknowledge the person of His Excellency Daniel Sopuru, who is based in the country of Nigeria and responsible for all those in our Franco regions. I want to acknowledge the person of His Excellency Olusogun Olukoya and His Excellency Olusogun Olukoya, responsible for our youth development within the class of steel structure. And I equally want to acknowledge Her Excellency Bishop Dr. Comfort Adu, who is based in Ghana, and Her Excellency Bishop Dr. Adu is responsible for our monarchs of the nations, monarchs of Africa specifically, but equally of the nations. And she's responsible for correspondence between high level dignitaries, presidents, kings, and high level ambassadors. So with that being said, we want to welcome you to this evening's class. And I trust that this evening's class will add significant value to you. This evening's class is in the structure of a lecture, an open lecture, where I will be sharing some of the dynamics of inspiration. I want to look at inspiration. One of the key things that we find that all of us struggle with is either getting inspiration or maintaining inspiration. Those are two of the most fundamental things that we have to deal with on a continued basis. For everything that you do, you're going to need inspiration, everything. If you do anything based on somebody's just asking you to do it and you just choose to do it out of wanting to assist or support, and it is without your personal inspiration, even if it is a United Inspired Initiative, if you don't have inspiration for what you're doing, it is not going to last very long if you're not inspired. I want to ask you a question, because as we look at what we're doing in our lives, in our callings, in our purposes, there's a very important question that I want to ask us. Are you inspired? Look at yourself right now and where you are currently, and, and, and be honest with yourself. Do you feel inspired? Do you feel excited about what is, is ahead of you. Inspiration speaks of an excitement about what's coming, what, what is ahead of you, what you're currently doing, because obviously anytime that we're doing something, it is with the expectation of an outcome. So inspiration is based on the expectation you have for the outcome. Are you inspired to, to be seated in the audience that you're seated in? Are you excited about being on the team that you're on? Are you inspired about the job that you're doing? Are you inspired? Are you feeling an excitement and a buzz and a, and a zeal or has that been zapped from you? I want you to ask yourself that question this evening. Pause for a moment. You pause. All of Let's pause and think about it. Because sometimes we get so wrapped up in the what we are doing. 
how we do it, how we're going to get it done. We get so wrapped up in those dynamics that we lose inspiration. I've lost inspiration quite a few times as a mentor, as a bishop, as a husband, as a family person. I've lost inspiration quite a few times. I've lost inspiration based on places that I've been and I had expectations and my expectations were disappointed. They were not realized and you lose inspiration. And as we go through this evening's class and lecture, I want you to think about yourself. Look at the things that matter to you the most and focus on the fact of the matter. Are you still inspired or have you lost inspiration? While you're doing that, I want to ask you another question that's very important. What is the number one thing for you to be focused on at this current moment? What is the number one thing? You know, we say there's so many things to focus on, so many things. At any given point in time in life, we have a myriad of things to focus on. We do family, business, ministry, personal development, character, attitude. There are a number of things that, that we have to give our attention to. For example, some individuals are looking at their personal development and are developing their mind. So they have a, a, a hunger, a hunger for knowledge. They're reading books, they are, they are watching videos, they are, they are stimulating themselves with, with all levels of, of inter interesting conversations. And they're stimulating their minds because they're looking at becoming intellectually sound or, or intellectually stable or capable. So they're feeding their mind. So they're inspired, wow. There are individuals who are inspired to train their bodies. So they're going to the gym and they're working out and they, they're buzzing and they're excited and, and they're going to the gym. Why? Because they look in the mirrors and, and maybe they have a few mates or a few friends that are looking really buff and really good, or a few ladies have a, have a few friends that, that have the tucks in the right place and, and, and are looking fit. And you yourself decide you want to get more energy or you want to get more fit. So you're focusing on your physical development. So you're inspired. The others who, who, who decided that they have some free time on their hands and as a result of their free time, they think, you know, I'm going to do some gardening going to do some gardening or around my my house and and around the property and you know i've been working and and i i, I don't have time to do it so i want to just give myself some time to do some gardening so they become inspired because they pass and they see their neighbor's garden looking good the one next to them looks good the one the other side looks good so they become inspired to do some gardening i'm sharing these things with us because I really want us to get a revelation about inspiration. So be with me on this journey, please. There are some individuals that they've been working so many years and they decide I need to get a hobby. I don't have a hobby. As a matter of fact, I recently, I recently decided that I'm going to pick up another hobby since my son was born. I decided that I recognize my son is very interested in, in, in gaming and he's very interested in technology. And, and I decided, hey, you know what? Let me pay an interest in a particular game that was extremely challenging and extremely difficult because personally, I love a challenge. 
I'm into computers and technology, and I, I love a challenge. Anything that is difficult to, to get done, I'm one of the persons that I, I get a buzz from a challenge. How many of you are like me? If you're like me, that you get a buzz out of a challenge. I mean, it just, it just, it just excites you. I mean, when you finish it, when you finish it, the, the purpose of doing it wasn't really just to, to, to finish it only, but when you finish it, it's done. And you want to go on to another challenge. I'm one of the persons that I love a challenge. And when I feel that I have mastered something, then I kind of give myself the, the human pat on the back and say, well done. And I sit back and I look at others who are, you know, trying to do the same thing and I get pleasure out of looking at, oh, I see why he's having difficulties there. And I like to teach my son about those little things. So, so parenting and, 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 and fatherhood and, and teaching my son to overcome challenges is, is, is a buzz for me. But first, I have to overcome those challenges to help my son. So I picked up a bit of gaming. If you see me playing any game on YouTube with my son, don't be surprised that your, your mentor plays games because I have a little buzz for a game. But I really want us to look at this thing called inspiration this evening seriously. Because you notice that I mentioned a number of facets to myself. Gardening, mental, physical, my son, gaming. And all of those things take inspiration, each of them. You agree with me that each of those things takes some level of inspiration to continue doing them? All of them. Look at your personal life. And everything that you're doing takes inspiration. So I want to ask you a question. Again, another question. Why have you lost inspiration? Why have you lost it? Why have you lost or did you lose inspiration? Or are you losing inspiration? Why? Let's go back to our scenarios. I talked about traveling to countries and I lost inspiration for what I wanted to accomplish there. Why? I came to the United Kingdom in 2016. I, I returned here to the UK after the death of my father. I returned to the UK fully inspired London is it. The United Kingdom is, is going to be the place where I'm going to make my mark. I'm going to establish my, my ministry. I'm a bishop. I'm going to establish my ministry, and I'm going to, to fulfill that calling that God had placed on my life. I'm going to get back into the Metropolitan Police Service. I'm going to get back into the, the British Caribbean Association. I'm going to get back into all of the things that I was doing that really excited me. I'm going to get back into those things. Because that's what I was doing many years prior. But how many of you know that sometimes the change in life, your age, your energy, your, your interests, they change. And sometimes when you show up expecting that you will have the, the tenacity and the zeal and the energy to, to jump head on into what you thought you were going to jump head on into, you recognize that there's some dynamics that take precedence. There's some dynamics that take precedence. So while you were away from what you were being inspired that you're going to do, 
by the time you get to the table, you find that your inspiration is gone. Because all of a sudden you recognize, wow, I've just got back to the UK 2016. I didn't land in London. I landed in Manchester. First issue. London is quite a way. Getting established in a place in London is quite a distance. The dynamics change. When I was in Manchester, I'm thinking I don't I don't want to do what I'm what I want to do in London in Manchester. I want to do it in London. So I have to position myself to be back in London. How many of you are with me? And then you find out you have a you're not alone anymore. You have a wife, you have a son, and you have a family to look after. Your charitable work and your humanitarian work, it cannot take precedence right now. You have to focus on earning. Establishing a home, putting a family on its foundation. So the dynamics changed and the inspiration, it died. A sudden death. I want to talk to us because I need you to know something. There are some fundamentals that you have to maintain if you intend to be successful. I'm gonna say that again. There are some fundamentals you have to maintain if you intend to be successful. If you intend to maintain inspiration, there are some fundamentals that you do not have a choice but to maintain. But before I get into those fundamentals, I want to give you another scenario. When you go through a crisis in life, a lot of times, crisis destroys inspiration. One, I think one of the reasons why I have become such an eloquent speaker or teacher or mentor is because I have a myriad of experiences that, that have really shaped my character and who I am as a person. And when you look at the dynamics of your existence on the earth, the times you are fired up with your business, and then it fell apart. The times you were fired up with your relationship and then it fell apart. The times you were fired up with an organization that you were part of and then it fell apart. How many of you know it's very easy to become double-minded and wavering and here today and there tomorrow, inspired today and discouraged tomorrow. It's easy. All of us experience those dynamics. The beautiful thing about the class of steel is that we are in an environment where every single person can identify with our challenges, our difficulties, our ups and our downs. We're not small children in the class of steel. We are mature adults. What separates us from each other? What makes us different? The only thing that makes us different is our ability to hold on and to keep on keeping on. I'll say that again. The only thing that makes all of us different and unique is our ability to hold on or our ability to keep on keeping on. Holding on means that there is reason to let go or to fall off. 
Holding on means that the vision is no longer holding you and pulling you and carrying you. Come on, somebody. How many of you know that you could be in an organization and you could feel a little down today, but but you you just hold, you don't you don't need to hold on because the people that are there, you love them so much. You like seeing them. And even if you feel a little discouraged, you just still just come and sit in your front house or you sit in your living room with your family. Why? Because you love being in the audience. So the audience keeps you in those times that you cannot keep yourself. Are you with me? A lot of individuals have, have been in churches and they become disillusioned. But the only thing that kept them going was they had somewhere to go and sit among people that they know might be similar to them. And even though they're discouraged and, and overwhelmed, they still kept on keeping on. Why? Because they had company. But how many of you know if the church rejects you and tell you you're no longer welcome? How many of you know if the organization says, I'm sorry, I don't want you anymore. You're not fit for task. Now you have to be in a place where you have to decide for yourself if you are going to keep on keeping on to reach your fulfill the fulfillment of your vision or if you are going to let go and give up and throw in the tumble and call it another dead vision, another broken promise, another, another failed initiative. Only you can make that determination sometimes. The next question I'm going to ask you before I get into some of the points about keeping your inspiration, you see, a lot of individuals ask me, and I'm diverting a little bit, how do you manage to keep focus when you're having a message? How do you manage it? I said I've managed it because over the years, I've learned to be metho <laughs> metho <laughs> methodical. I need to, I need Odukola. Odukola, I need you. <laughs> methodical. <laughs> where, is, where is my brother Olukoya? Olukoya, speak to me. <laughs> Olukoya, I, it is, it's, it's methodical. Is that correct, Olukoya? Yes, Your Excellency. <laughs> you know, when you don't use words so often, they sound very strange to you, and you even challenge your own intellect sometimes. Methodical. I'm very, very, I'm very, very strategic in what I do and what I'm going to do and how I'm how I'm going to present it. So let me go back and, and, and say this. We have to remain in an environment where we remain inspired in spite of what goes on around us. We have to be in an environment where it is not about the church. It is not about the organization. It is not about the people who are doing it. It is not because my neighbor's garden look good. It is because I'm going to do this and I'm going to accomplish it no matter what happens. No matter what happens. You should write that point down. No matter what happens. If you start a task and you are inspired the first tool that you need is the tool of no matter what happens, I will remain committed to finishing this. No matter what happens, write that down, chew on it, chew on it, chew on it even this moment. 
Because a lot of you are dealing with situations that are frustrating us, overwhelming us. Have you noticed I specifically said a lot of you, and then I said, are dealing with situations that are frustrating, and I said us, overwhelming us, and causing us difficulties in deciding and determining if we are going to remain committed to accomplishing them. A lot, a lot of us, all of us. I look at the class of steel and I can be very honest with you. I have become frustrated, overwhelmed. I've spent a lot of time in prayer before God and tears and, and counseling with, with His Excellency, Dr. Ewers. That's why he's my chief of protocol, because he knows when a, a man of God or, or a person with a vision needs inspiration. He knows when a person needs encouragement. You've got to understand, if you have someone on your team that when you are discouraged, they agree with you, it's a bad person to have on your team. I'm going to say that to you again because you need to you need to identify that. If you have someone on your team that when you are discouraged, that person is equally discouraged and shows you reasons to be discouraged. Hey, somebody, my God, I feel an anointing just now. If you have such individuals on your team, you are not going to remain inspired. You will not. I want to even bring a biblical scenario. And please allow me as a bishop, this is not a preaching Christian platform for me to, to, to promote my Christian ideologies. It's not one of those. But I want to, if you would allow me to share a, a Christian perspective and understanding there was a brother called Job, and we know Job so well. And he was so discouraged. And he had he had some brothers that were good friends. Come on, some all of us have these good friends. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And his friends came and, and looked at him. He's discouraged. He's down. He's sick. And all of a sudden, they started to find reasons why it is happening to him. I know why this is happening to you. How many of you have ever been going on a journey and, and somebody calls you and you yourself, Minister Ewers, you could testify to this. You yourself had trepidations. You, you have anxieties. You, you need counsel, you need wisdom. And everybody you call, add to that frustration. Add to that worry. They, they, what, are, what are they doing? They're sucking the inspiration from you. Hey, I want to, I want to build a house. Hey, I'm going to build a house. I'm excited. Yeah, you just come from a conference. House building on your first property. They taught you about getting an architect. Once you've got the land, get an architect. And once you get an architect, if you don't have the resources to do it, you could do it block by block, or you could go get a mortgage. And you're excited. You're, you're armed with the information. You've got, you've got all your notes. All your notes are all together. Your pieces of, of papers and, and your files and everything, you've got it. Hey, and you're excited. And then as you get home, you sit down and you talk to your husband or your wife. Oh, Lord. And I'm not knocking anybody because I thank God that God has granted us husbands and wives and partners that encourage or inspire us. Because that's a blessing in this. That's a blessing in itself. And you talk to 
your partner and your partner is, yes, darling, this is a good idea. Woo, I like this. This is good. We could do this. Yes. And you're so excited even more. And then you go out and you talk to your best friend. This is what I will be doing. And best friend doesn't own a house. And best friend looks at you and said, are you serious? Do you know how difficult that is? Do you know how much problems you're gonna face? I know so many construction workers, oh my God. If I could tell you the stories of how they have robbed people, oh my God. And all of a sudden, you think, well, I at least believe God that I will find some good workers. And then you think about financing and you decide you're going to go and get a mortgage. You've, you've got some currency put aside, so you're going to go and add to it by getting a mortgage. I'm talking to you about inspiration and losing inspiration, and I want you to follow with me. Don't focus on me talking about building a property. Focus on what you are doing yourself and look at the individuals that are matching up to the individuals in the scenario that I'm talking to you about. Don't don't say I'm not building a house so this is not relevant to me. This is relevant to every single individual if you are building a life, an organization, a company, a association, or a relationship, or even a marriage. This is relevant to you. You think about getting a mortgage. Somebody says, why don't you get advice in getting a mortgage? Which is a good idea. It's a good idea always to get advice. And then you hear the advice say, oh, don't get a mortgage. You don't need a mortgage. You're too young. You have your whole life ahead of you. Why are you going to get a mortgage? You need to work and save some more. Don't be stupid. Or you're too old. How, what are you going to do getting a mortgage at your age? What are you leaving for your children to do? There's always a negative, always, always. And you hear the myriad of horror stories. I want to tell you something. Come on, somebody. I hope you're getting inspired this evening. I hope you're getting inspired to tell some folks, you know what? I need to check my Rolodex and tear up some leaves out of my Rolodex. Some of you are going to have to check your Rolodex and tear up some leaves. Some of you are going to have to check your WhatsApp messages and determine who you're going to stop looking at their messages. Some of you are going to just have to do it. I'm advising you. The road to success is a lonely road. You'll always find that when you're going there, it's not even the most popular road taken. Why? Everybody wants shortcuts. Everybody wants quick fixes. Everybody wants now, now blessings, microwave blessings. Everybody want immediate, it's done. No work, no effort, it's simple. If it looks like it's gonna be a challenge, it's not worth doing, that looks too difficult. Do you know how many people tried that and they didn't do it? I'm going to go back now to telling you some more points about what kills inspiration. Nobody kills inspiration. Nobody. Nobody. I want you to listen carefully. I have sat in meetings, high level meetings, with individuals that I was sharing my vision with them. And they rejected me and they tore me to shreds. Listen to me. I want you to listen to me. You've got to listen. And, 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 and I want you to hear yourself and hear those who have been in your personal ears. I want you to hear them. They tore me to shreds. 
that I have walked out of meetings with, with tears in my eyes. And I couldn't even come home to my wife. I, I had to go for long walks. My wife would, would share with you that there were times that I went for walks. And, and when I realized that I've walked over 8 and 10 and 12 kilometers, just thinking, just trying to, just trying to figure out how can I recover from this discouragement? I, I almost want to tell you, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, walk it out, 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 walk it out. Keep on keeping on. Don't sit down and, and allow it to, to get fester inside of you and, and become cancerous to your inspiration. Anything that you allow to sit too long within your mental faculties that you're feeding with more is inspiration, inspiring you to give up, inspiring you to quit, is going to be a cancer to your personal vision and accomplishments that you're setting up to accomplish. Walk it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. Run it out if you run. Run it out. Go get a run. Run it out. I'm going to do this. I'm not giving up. I am not going to give up. This is, this is painful, but I'm not giving up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Giving up for me is not an option. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've come too far to give up now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. I've come too far. I've invested too much. I'm going to lose all of my investment. I'm going to lose all of the, the hopes that I had. I'm going to lose all of those people that I, I told them, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. All those people are going to laugh at me and mock me and say, look at you. I told you. You don't accomplish anything. They find it easy to tell you you don't accomplish anything when you, when you mess up. They find it very easy. But when you've accomplished it, they are silent. Come on, somebody, wave at me if you get what I'm saying. I want you to wave at me if you get what I'm saying. They are silent. You don't hear a peep out of them. You know what? You know the next time you hear your, your critics? You want me to tell you the next time you hear your critics? Is when you are attempting to do something else again. That is when they're going to come alive again. Why? Because they thrive on discouraging you. They thrive on making you look bad or look dumb or look stupid. They thrive on killing your dream. A lot of us heard about destiny, destiny builders and destiny keepers, destiny helpers. But I want to tell you they're destiny killers and dream killers as real as you have destiny helpers and dream and dream builders you have dream killers and destiny killers and you've got to determine who is who in your circle and you've got to figure it out early in the process of your building figure it out early and when you figure it out Unless you become like me, where you could take a vision to your worst critic that will say to you, it's not going to work. You're going to fail. Oh, I've seen so many people fail and they're, they're going to keep you. You will not work. It will not work for you. Oh, but come on, somebody. When, you, when you've developed backbone, when you've developed backbone, you see, life develops backbone in you. Good mentors, a good mentor gives you backbone. A good mentor, a good teacher, a good best friend, a good wife, a good husband, a good companion gives you stamina. You can listen to them. And while you're listening to them, you're listening to them with the ear that is saying, I wonder where you are going to become positive. I wonder when you are going to become somebody that, that sees possibilities when others don't see possibility. 
You become one of those persons that when you see them, you actually feel sorry for them. How many of you have some negative people that you genuinely feel sorry for them? I've got some negative, I feel sorry for them. I do, I do, I do. I feel sorry for individuals who in the midst of a storm, as chaotic as it might be, you don't see, if everybody else dies, I'm going to live. And even if I die, at least I know I died believing I was going to live. Come on, somebody. You've got to keep on keeping on till the very end. You've got to keep on keeping on. What are some of the other inspiration killers? I said it's not people, it's you, it's ourselves. Because you see, what people do to us does not dictate how we respond. You should, you should take that note. What somebody does to you or says to you does not dictate how you respond. It does not. How you respond is based on how you interpret what they said or what they did. It's you personally. Oh, but you made me. Nobody makes you do nothing. Unless, of course, you're a subordinate. And, and, and if you're a subordinate, you, you do as you're told. If you don't do as you're told, then you're insubordinate. <laughs> Interesting. And if you do as you're told and something goes wrong, guess what? You were not insubordinate, you just follow the instructions. A long time ago, I have learned if I'm following your instructions and, and something goes wrong, it doesn't even bother me. If I'm following your instructions against my better judgment and the instructions that I give you to do something else, and I'm talking about in an employer-employee circumstance or situation. If I'm working for a company, and, and, and by the way, I gosh, I don't remember the last time I worked for a company. My goodness. But if I'm working for someone and they give me instructions and I and I shared with them that I think there's a better way or a more acceptable way and they and, and they instructed me to go the way they choose, which is about about against my better judgment, and I have to do it out of professional protocol. When I do it and it goes wrong, it does not even bother me. I go home and I collect my salary at the end of the month and it does not bother me. Why? Because I'm a subordinate. And in order to keep my job, I will not be insubordinate. Are you with me? One of the difficult things about being a leader is when you give individuals instructions and they follow it and it goes wrong, you have to know how to take responsibility. But there are times that you have to be at the place where you are managing your own personal affairs. You are managing your inspiration. You have to be at the place where no matter what anybody says, contrary to what you want to accomplish, unless, of course, let's be real, let's be real. There are some things that individual will tell you that if you get a popular opinion, you will find out this is not going to work. And you have to come to a place where you appreciate facts and truth. Are you with me? I'm not talking about being stupid, arrogant, bullheaded. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you have a vision and somebody defies it without credible facts or proof. That's what I'm talking about. So I really want you to strike the balance. 
If your car has two wheels because you just had an accident and two of the wheels broke off and you're on the axle and you believe that you could drive the car on the two back wheels and push it all the way five miles to the petrol station and somebody says, please don't drive the car like that, you'll destroy it. I've seen cars that tried to do that and they got destroyed. Come on, common sense will tell you it, it is a fact. So I'm, I'm not talking about those blatant facts that steer you in the face. I'm talking about facts that can't be proven. It can't be proven that when you go to the bank, you're not going to get a good deal from the bank. It can't be proved. It can't be proved that when you get workers on your construction site, that they're not going to be good to you. It can't be proved. That is only proved when you have those individuals and they work for you. It can't be proved that because somebody robbed somebody else, they're going to rob you. It can't be proved. It can only be proved when that happens to you. Are, are you with me? There's some things that, that you, you have to realize that, that no, you, I'm not going to allow you to discourage me. It can't be proved that the class of steel is going to fail. It cannot be proved. Why? It can't be proved because as we continue to work and as we continue to build, we will just get better and better and better every day. We will continue to add and improve and we will continue to add value to our portfolio and we will continue to become recognized even if it is a small little bit at a time. But as we continue to grow, it will manifest itself with results tangible that we could say, I am glad I'm a part of the class of steel. It can't be proved that, don't worry, you're going to give up and you're not going to make it. It can't be proved. Because I don't have no foreseeable circumstance that I could see other than the Lord bringing me home or health that incapacitates me from being here. But I personally believe that even if I'm on a hospital bed and I could talk, I would want somebody bring the microphone and the camera so that I could speak to my class of steel. Because even in my dying breath, I'm still going to be a motivator. Why? Because it is just who I am. I cannot do anything other than who I really am. Just like you, you can't be nobody else. I remember somebody saying to me, when I became a Christian, I was one of those fire Christians. How many of you know those fire Christians? Every single thing that turned, everything that turned, it got saved. Every single thing. I have, I have led personally a few thousand people to Christ personally, by myself one-on-one. -on -one. Personally, why? Because of my zeal, my love for, 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 for recognizing, oh my God, serving my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I could never imagine there could be anything on the face of the earth more fulfilling or satisfying than being a Christian. That is me. I still feel that way to this very second that I'm talking. But I remember individuals looking at me and saying, don't worry. You're going to lose that fire. Don't worry. You're going to have some people and some situations in life that's going to knock that fire from you. How many of you know when you hear that at, at 17 years old and you're excited, you think, uh-oh. But I, rose, I remember I rose up with some grannies in the church and they used to sing these songs. Every day with Jesus. It's sweeter than the day before. And you see, I'm not, I'm not preaching a message to you as a, as, a, as, a, as a bishop and a minister. I'm talking to you about inspiration, and I'm talking to you about whatever you are. If you are a Muslim, if you're an Indian, if you're a Hindu, whoever you are, whatever you are doing in life, if you are not inspired, if you are not fired up about what you're doing, you will not be successful. You will lose your focus. You will lose your way. Why? Because life will just do that to you. And those grannies would sing every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. 
And I used to say to myself as a young man, I wonder what these old people are singing this sweeter every day like for. What is this? What is this sweeter than the day before? Oh, but when you go through life, and by the way, I'm not preaching a Christian message. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping you, keep it focused. Stay focused. Though. Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't leave me. When you go through a situation that rocks your foundation and you have a relationship that you could sit down by yourself and gain sustenance and strength to carry on, you understand what those old folks were talking about. In the class of steel, we're a family. We're not perfect. We're not made up of individuals who have got it all together perfectly, who don't have troubles and difficulties. But you know what we're made up of? Individuals who know how to keep on keeping on. You see, I'm not talking about your Christian faith. I'm not talking about your Muslim. I'm not talking about your Buddhist. I'm not talking about nothing to do just with your faith. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your inspiration. What inspires you? What is keeping you fired up? Why did that person last 30 years and 40 years in the company? Because they were inspired. And they never lost their inspiration. It's not because a better job didn't come. It's not because more pay wasn't available. It's because they were inspired. Whatever it is that inspired them. I'm going to tell you something in the class of Steve that I believe. I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe that every single person under the sound of my voice is going to be successful. I'm telling you personally what I believe. It is a matter for you to agree with me, but I'm going to talk to you. Can I talk to you, please? Can I, can I have permission to talk to you as a mentor? I want to talk to you. Wave at me. Let me see your hand if it's okay. Is it okay? Bishop Comfort, can I talk to you? Yes? I want to talk to you. I want to tell you something. Every single one of you under my voice are going to be successful. I do not care what they throw at you. Listen to me. Hear me in your ears. You are going to be successful. Hear what I just said. You are going to, you could smile, you, you could turn off, you could turn off the recording. You could leave the class so still immediately. You don't need to hear another word from me. You could shut your eyes and remember what I say to you. And every situation in life, remember, Dr. Michael Steele told me, he said to me irrevocably, I am going to be successful. And if nobody believes me, if nobody encourages me if nobody stands with me I'm still believing that man of God told me I was going to be in a, a success I was going to be successful and I believe him I don't know why I believe him I don't see any reason to believe him I don't see any point that he has made that is relevant to my current situation why I should be successful but my God something deep inside of me has been desperate to hear you are going to make it and I believe it is me that he's talking to and I am going to be successful. I was living on the streets when I was 19 years old. And I could remember as clear as it, I could remember so clear this thought that I had. I can remember it so clearly. It haunts me. I could remember it so clear that it haunts me. I was walking on the streets and my stomach because of hunger had gotten so small. And you could feel your rib, your, your, your spine. You could feel your spine with your stomach. I can't explain that to anybody because I don't know how to explain it otherwise. 
and there is a perpetual knot in your stomach because, because you're hungry, your stomach gets smaller and it draws up. If you know medical science, you will know what I'm talking about. If you drink one cup of water, your stomach will be full. And I remember, I remember walking along the beach <laughs> and a voice in my head said to me, you are gonna travel all over the world and you're gonna be so successful. <laughs> The reason why I'm laughing, <laughs> the reason why I'm laughing is I didn't even act how. I didn't even act nothing. I was thinking you are mad in your head. Madness is going on in you, boy. What travel the world are you going to do? You don't know no father, you're fatherless. You are homeless, you live on the street. No family that, that, that is looking out for you. What are you talking about? You're on the streets. Strangers are, are giving you something to eat. What are you talking about, boy? This is what I said to myself after hearing this weirdness in my head. Come on, somebody. You gotta, you gotta believe some voice. You, you've got to. Be, you are gonna be so successful. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. If you persist, you are gonna be so successful. All of you. I'm telling you. I'm repeating it to you from my background. I'm repeating it to you. You're gonna be successful, and you're gonna, you're gonna laugh at the days you're currently experiencing. Some of you. And I remember from the streets, the Lord opened the door for me to go into this church. It's called the People's Cathedral in Barbados. And there was a, there was a minister on the 4th of November, 1992. I remember at that point in 1992, the 4th of November, I went into the People's Cathedral. I was going there for many, many years, back and forth, back and forth. But on the 4th of November, 1992, this minister came and he said, there is somebody in here that greatness is on them. And you need to come. You need to come to this altar and recommit your life. <laughs> And, and this funny voice in my head said, I mean you. <laughs> He's talking to you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I'm not schizophrenic because at least if I was schizophrenic, I think I did I did very well with being schizophrenic and getting this far. And Minister Ewers and some folks know me quite well. I I, I heard the voice, the, that same haunted voice saying, I mean you. It is you. And I sat down, I was in the back of the church. I will never forget. And he said, I'm not stopping this call until somebody comes. There are over 2,000 people that were there and nobody got up. Not one single person. Professor Ricardo Caldwell that was preaching in the People's Cathedral. Nobody got up. And I heard the voice saying, it is you. I said, if it is me, tell him, see somebody in the back row. <laughs> I said it in my head. I didn't say it aloud because my heart was beating fast. <laughs> 
Come on, somebody. I'm having fun this evening. If you're not having fun, I'm promising you, I'm having a great time this evening. And he said, there's some young man in the back row. The Lord is dealing with you. <laughs> Come on. There, there, and, I, and I raised my hand because I couldn't escape. He says, come, come. And that man hugged me. And when he hugged me, tears ran out of my eyes. And I felt like somebody said, come home, son. I've got work for you to do. <laughs> and on the 18th of March, on the 18th of March, 1993, after going through the training and the converts class in 1993, I was baptized. And in 1994, I started traveling. My God. I was on so many planes that I started to not like traveling on a plane anymore. For me right now, a plane is just somewhere to get from point A to point B like a car. Minister Ewers will tell you, I, I, I am not interested. I'm not buzzed. I'm not in. Why? Because when you get inspired and you realize I've been inspired and you, you grab a hold of what was said to you, don't let it go. No matter what anybody says to you, if you say you're going to build a corporation, you're going to build a company, you're going to establish what you are trying to establish. If you're going to invent something, if you're going to create something, I don't care if you are Christian, you are Muslim, you are Buddhist, I am not interested in your religious ideology, or even if you have no religious affiliation, what I'm saying to you this evening is you need to be inspired and you need to keep your inspiration. Hold on to it. The same rain that falls on the righteous falls on the ungodly. The same inspiration that comes from, for one comes for another. If you keep the right company and you learn how to manage your associations, you will be successful. But a lot of you are going to have to stay the course because one message is not going to make you successful. You see, when I was 19, I heard that. But it took a whole lot of years and teaching and getting rid of, of the way I think about myself, the way I felt about myself, the way I felt about my own life and, and things that happened to me. It took a whole long time to get rid of all the baggage that we carry that hinder us. You see, baggage will hinder you. That's why I'm here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Because every time you come, I'm going to chip away at a little bit of the baggage. Chip away at it. Chip away at it. And every time you look at yourself, you're going to see yourself getting what? Better. Ooh, I'm more successful. I'm more confident. I'm more competent. I'm more capable. I'm happier. Oh, that one didn't hit me as hard as it used to hit me. Oh, getting rid of that person didn't hurt as much as I thought it would. Oh, stop going to that place. Didn't hurt as much. Are you with me? I'm going to close with this. Rule number one. You must be inspired. Rule number two. Let it be self-inspiration. Rule number three. Look at the persons that are around you are the things that are around you that affect your inspiration and manage them wisely. If you cannot convert them into wise counsel to look at what could possibly go wrong and they discourage you, remove yourself 
from that environment. But if you could look at that negative voice or that negative person and you could glean wisdom from what they're saying to change and tweak some of what you're doing so you could become better and not bitter, then use that person and use that communication for your benefit, to your advantage. And keep that person in your circle. Because a negative person is not a bad person. It just determines on how negative they are as opposed to how inspired you are. If they're more negative than you're inspired, then their negativity is going to override your inspiration and you're going to become discouraged. If you're more positive that their negativity, their negativity is going to come, for sure it will come, but what it will do is it will add information to your inspiration and you can determine whether or not you need to focus and tweak some of your zeal. Sometimes we need to tweak our zeal with regards to the persons that come and tell us this will never happen. And sometimes they're right if we look at our zeal in the dynamic. Are you with me? Sometimes we, we have zeal to think, oh, the class of Steve is gonna be a huge success in one year. Come on, somebody, it's one year and we're still building. We're still searching and, and trying to sort out things. So in our zeal, we think that because of who's with us, we're gonna accomplish it quicker. But reality shows us that's not true. So what do we do? We curb our zeal. How am I operating now? I'm operating one day at a time. Focus, determined. So we use information to help ourselves. And the final point is, the final point, any divine inspiration that you could find outside of people, outside of places, outside of things, outside of yourself. If you could find divine inspiration like I have found in Christ, divine, heavenly, internal, personal, universal, for me alone, nothing to do with anybody else that loves me or cares about me. If you could find that inspiration and you tap into that source, that will be your greatest asset in your success. Why am I so successful? I think I'll tell you because I am not worried about man's opinion of me. I am inspired by a divine calling that is in me that will take me for eternity. I hope that this evening's class inspires you to find your own personal inspiration. I'm His Excellency Dr. Michael Steele and I wanna appreciate you and thank you for listening to this evening's class attentively. I hope it adds value to you. I'm gonna open the class for any questions, comments or dialogue. Um, is there any person that you want to raise your hand and jump in and break the ice? Get fired up. No, nope, nobody wants to share anything. The class is silent. I've I've been such a good teacher. Okay, I see you. I see you. Uh, I see you, Zionist. Go ahead, Zionist. Thank you, Your Excellency, for such a wonderful um, teaching. Um, two, two things. Um, when you mentioned about um, uh, negative uh, people, um, affiliating ourselves with negative people, one thing I draw from what you said is that negative people are not necessarily bad for our inspiration. Uh, we need to um take from them what is good um from them and jettison what is not good but never to allow them to influence our inspiration um in accordance with their own 
um, interpretation or design. And uh, yes, so I find that very, very helpful because I have people around me who, who are not thinking a long distance wavelength as myself. But I see something good in them, but also realize that there can be um, too much of a yoke for me to carry. So in carrying them, my own inspiration is sinking low. And um, I have to be very uh, tactful in the way I deal with them, in the way I relate with them. I don't want them to think that, um, you know, um, they are there for me to be used and then discarded. And so I have to be very tactful uh, with them. But sometimes you ask yourself, is this really right? Is this biblical? You know, and, you know, having heard you this evening, I feel inspired to go back and to reevaluate my relationship um, with people and make a firm decision on which way uh, is best for me to go. So I think that's one, one of the key things that I've taken from here, going back, going away and reevaluating my relationship with certain key people um, in my life. So, yeah, and, you know, I am so happy that, you know, I, I attended this very um, class. A lot of things is beginning to loosen up around me. I'm not wearing a tight belt around my waist, but I feel like there's some shifting going on around me. Not comfortable, but it has to be said, it has to be heard, and it has to be done. So I'm ever so grateful. Thank you very much. And God bless you. You're welcome. On the point that you 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 brought up about um, good 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 advice could come sometimes from persons that are negative to your vision. I've discovered something. I've discovered something. Humans are. Humans are genuinely good. All human beings are genuinely good. There, 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 there is good in every single person. There is good in every, in every single person. Being a, being a minister for ex-offenders for so many years taught me that as bad and as vagabond as a person might be to a community or a nation, but he treats granny and he treats those in his community so respectful and so loving. And some of the bad things he does, he does them for good reasons. That, that almost doesn't make sense. It's almost chaotic to think about. But every single human being in in, 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 in our natural nature are, have good intentions. Even the persons who are telling you, for example, I'm gonna use a, a very interesting example. When Judas was talking to, to, to Jesus, and, and Judas is a, a perfect example to use. When Jesus was, talk, Judas was talking to Jesus about, hey, that money that she used could have been used to do this and do that and feed the poor, blah, blah, blah. We look at the intention that he might have made to keep it to himself. But in all honesty, the truth possibly is that that money really could have been used to do something good and, and feed some poor people. Don't, don't let us get all super spiritual because we know the outcome of the whole dynamic. But, you know, he could have been having a good intention. Maybe that is even the very reason why the Lord kept him around and didn't eradicate him because he knew that he had some good intentions. You, you know what I mean? So everybody has good intentions. You, you can't judge the intentions of someone. But your vision, your vision demands understanding. And if you have someone that is going to undermine your vision without understanding what you're doing, 
It has nothing to do with their intention. It has nothing to do with their intention. It has to do with you preserving your, your vision and your inspiration. That's all that is coming into account. Nothing else really matters. A, a, a woman that is inside of a, a speedboat that is a woman that is big pregnant and in a speedboat that is rushing to get her to the to, to the across the river, but the driver does not understand. She says, please, you need to drive slowly, please. Please, you have to drive slower. The driver doesn't understand that the speed and the bumping can cause her to lose her baby. So for her to say to you, please, please, sir, you got to stop. His intention is to get her there quicker. But, her, but, but her, her intention is to save her baby. So in order to save her baby, she has to decide one thing. Stop this boat and put me off now. I will swim the rest of the way or I will let somebody else come and pick me up. But I can't allow you to drive me like this and make me abort my baby. How many of you get the example that I just shared? You, you, you have to, you, his intentions are good. He wants to get you there quickly because you're crying. Oh, 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 please. Oh, oh, oh. Well, you, a woman can do that for two whole days and don't deliver a baby. And she knows that. But the driver that is rushing can cause her to get one sudden bump from a wave. Boop! And she will lose her baby just like that. So you have to manage how you carry your pregnancy, that baby that you want to deliver, which is your vision, which is your idea, which is your, your, your destiny. You have to manage it carefully and be very cautious of who you bring around you. I hope that adds value to, to, to what, what you were sharing, uh, Zionist. Yes, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. God bless you. All right. Um, your, your Excellency, Donald, you, as I see you shaking your head, my goodness, shaking, shaking, shaking. Your Excellency, do you have any comment for this evening's um, class? And thank you guys so very much for your patience with us this evening. I feel excited and inspired. A pleasant good evening, sir, and to the ambassadors in the house. Yes, it was a very inspiring topic about uh, positivity, inspiration. And um, I would just like to, because this is current, when we're about to go to Dubai, I had a, a pastor friend. We were communicating and talking that I was about to go to Dubai. The pastor friend mean well, but the negativity that he brought, he went. When I told him I was going to Dubai, uh, Googled it, find on the independent uh, newspaper saying that the red zone area that um, we can't go. No, that throw me. This is a very well known pastor in the community, he Googled, find it, and the negativity throw me. Had I not had somebody like you, who was very uh, focused, in spite of all that is happening for us to go to Dubai, in spite of don't even having a ticket to go to Dubai, you turn up at the airport and you were determined to go to Dubai to lead us without borders summit. So you have friends that can really throw you. Another ins uh, one was my sister who has never traveled to Dubai. She said, what on earth are you going to a terrorist country? <laughs> Why are you picking up yourself going to a terrorist country? She didn't, she never, she never traveled. She's never been to Dubai. She's never been to that country. I'm going to a terrorist country. So you can you imagine that is my own blood sister. So I could go on and on about negativity. And when your human being, just like the illustration you give about Job, Job friend said, tell us what you've done. You have must have committed a sin for you to reach this stage. The wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? 
So negativity, it can be such a killer if you're not strong enough, if you can't rise above it, it can finish you off. The Caribbean, where I'm from, crime is very high. And when people tell you about Jamaica and Jamaican parents, you would never put your foot on the island. But when you go to Jamaica, you don't see any crime. But people tell you, say, it's a crime infested island. Why you want to go to Jamaica? I mean, Nigerians give us the name, the Jamo. You know, Jamo, we want to go to Jamo. And so therefore, a lot of negativity flies around. Uh, the COVID-19, uh, COVID don't take the injection. After the injection, I'm still alive. And I could go on and on and on and on and on, sir, with negativity. And so therefore, we have to rise above it. And we have to know God for ourselves. And you have to know yourself. Because if you follow negativity, you will never accomplish your goal and accomplish what God has sent you in this world for. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much, Your Excellency, Dr. Ewers. And, and it's an interesting point. You know, when I was going to Nigeria um, to minister, they sent me so many videos of bodies that were mutilated at that time. <laughs> I'm telling you, they sent me so many videos. And when I show those, those videos to my wife of people being hacked to death based on what the Fulani herdsmen were doing and everything, and it even got worse. Where I was going was actually in the north exactly where a lot of that was happening. And I shared the videos with my wife and I says, darling, what do you think? <laughs> my wife said to me, darling, if God is sending you there, he will keep you. I said, darling, you're not afraid. <laughs> And I love my wife. Listen, I, I talk about her so much because she's an amazing human being. She's an amazing human being. God has been kind to me. My, my wife was just, well, darling, I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> but here is the thing. Here's the thing. You need to be in an environment where you recognize the world will be blow everything out of proportion negatively to destroy you and your dream. It will. But you have to determine how are you going to receive it. But then there's one other point. Your Excellency, don't ever forget this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to stop the recording now and I'm going to share a point with only you who are remaining because you remain. So I'm going to stop the recording and because you remain, I'm going to share a secret with you that I will not share with the public. So just give me one second. Let me close off everybody and stop the recording. And I'm going to give you a secret. I want to thank everybody for being with us this evening in the class of Steel. We appreciate you. I'm His Excellency Dr. Michael Steel. And we encourage you to join the class of Steel where you will get to be on the inside, on the inner circle. You could visit us at theclassofsteel.com. And you could check out how could you become a member of the Class of Steel? How could you be a part of what we do? I hope you could appreciate that we are a whole lot more than just six hours a week, which is Monday, two hours, maybe Wednesday, two hours, and Friday, two hours. The Class of Steel is a whole lot more than that. And in order to find out what more we are, I think you need to become a member of the Class of Steel so that you could be a part of the deeper things in what we do, why we do it, and why we are going to be successful and continue to do what we are doing. So you can visit the website, theclassofsteel.com, and you can even check out the Class of Steel on YouTube. You could check the Class of Steel on LinkedIn. We've just started on LinkedIn. So if you don't see a lot of followers, don't, be, don't judge us based on the followers you see. We've just started and we are building and going places. We want to acknowledge our partners, Leaders Without Borders um, Development Center. We want to also appreciate the Radical Leap Company 
and all of our other international partners, Her Excellency Dr. Anita Davis before one of our chief lecturers. And we want to celebrate you who have listened and give us your ear for such a message as this. I'm Dr. Michael Steele, and I'm gonna go and share some personal secrets with those in the class of steel for just their ears only and members. Good night and God bless you. We appreciate you. On the behalf of my family, my beautiful wife, Her Excellency Jeannie Steele, our partners, associates,